Lightning is a protocol, but no one cares about protocols. People care about what they can do. And so the product thinking is really what, where I think a lot of people fall short. Lightning is the only Bitcoin layer two that's Bitcoin native, I would say, uh, that exists today. I mean, the, other, the biggest other Bitcoin layer two is um, WBTC uh, on ETH or like custodial transfers. R running a multi-asset routing node um, is a whole nother ballgame. We are increasingly interested in serving, uh, providing our, our our Lightning infrastructure services in a non-custodial fashion using some cool tech we're working on. And in that mode of operation, splicing makes it a lot easier to build the seamless UX for the enterprise customer. You know, a lot of people don't realize that you can actually process a lot of transactions without that much Bitcoin on a Lightning node, especially if you're a custodial institution and you have, you know, flows in and out. We just closed a bunch of channels that we didn't need. Um, we didn't impact our payment processing with, um, success rates at all. Alex Leishman is the CEO of River, a US-based Bitcoin exchange that also offers Bitcoin mining and Lightning Network services. In our conversation, we got into the challenges with Lightning payments today and the potential solutions that could usher in the future of Lightning payments we got into the task of measuring growth on the Lightning Network. And then we got into River's strategy for managing one of the world's largest Lightning Network nodes. If you enjoyed this episode and if you learned something new, the best way you can show your support is by sending sats over the Lightning Network. You can use any podcasting 2.0 app. There are dozens of them out there, but my favorite one to use is Fountain. Before we get into today's show, just a quick message from our sponsors. Today's show is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is the premier provider of Bitcoin and Lightning node infrastructure. Today's show is also sponsored by Stackwork. And Stackwork is a Lightning powered transcription tool that takes the best of AIs and humans to create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. We'll have more from Voltage and Stackwork later in the show. Alex, welcome back to the show. You were on episode 50, I believe, in I think June of 2022. So for the new listeners who haven't heard that episode, can you give a brief introduction of both yourself and River? Absolutely, thanks for having me on. So I'm the CEO and CTO of River. We're a Bitcoin company that offers services to both individuals, businesses, and enterprises. We have a, uh, one side of our business is more financial services, Bitcoin brokerage, custody, um, hosted mining and wallet services. And then we have another side to the business, which is uh, focused on enterprises and developers, which is a Lightning Network infrastructure business. And that is an API that makes adding Lightning Network payments to your app very, very easy. Uh, it powers a growing number of exchanges worldwide and, and, and wallets, including uh, Chivo, the, the wallet of El Salvador. And um, we have some you know, cool new customers that hopefully we'll be able to announce in the coming months. Very cool. Um, on, on the topic of Chivo, I don't know if you're allowed to share any of this stuff, but I, I have to say, I'm curious to know how adoption has been going because it made a big splash when first announced and when it first rolled out in El Salvador, I haven't heard a whole lot since I haven't, I haven't really followed Chivo specifically very closely. Are you able to share any kind of metrics or, you know, sentiment in the country? I'm not, unfortunately, okay. but, um, I can speak to our overall um, just aggregate numbers as a company. We don't, we sort of have a policy of we don't speak to any specific clients of our business at all. Um, but um, we are seeing uh, really strong growth in tr transaction counts uh, across the board. And um, we are, we're actually working on a, a lightning report. So Sam, uh, Sam Wooders from, um, from our company, our, he our head of research, will be releasing a, a lightning report sharing uh, a lot of this data in the next few months, I believe. Awesome. I have been eagerly anticipating it. I, I saw that announcement. He was getting ready to write another lightning report and uh, I'll be the first one to read it when it's published, I'm sure. Um, I want to start with uh, a research report or a, a kind of blog post you guys had written uh, recently about lightning payments in 2025 and kind of like looking forward to the future of lightning and what that might have in store. Um, in it, you guys highlighted there's a few kind of key problems with Lightning today. Um, some of that 
tends to push people towards using custodial solutions. Um, the three problems you highlighted were that manual effort is required in a lot of cases, technical expertise is required, and then there's like a technical deficit or a lack of standardization. Um, why are these three big problems for, for lightning adoption today? Yeah, so you know, if you think about the, uh, the onboarding flow for using a non-custodial lightning wallet, um, it can be pretty uh, you know, like messy and, and intimidating. Um, a number of things can go wrong. And basically some of the things we're identifying is what are some of the, what's some of the work happening that can reduce the number of friction points um, when onboarding to Lightning, whether you're a consumer using a non-custodial consumer wallet or an enterprise um, looking to run Lightning yourself um, and, but, but do it easily. Um, I think a lot of people forget that um, most enterprises are just as lack have just as little knowledge as most consumers when it comes to lightning um, just because they're professional they're a professional operation for some industry doesn't mean they actually know anything about lightning either um, and so uh, so um, you know we, 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 we discussed a few things in the works that we do believe will make uh, will make that onboarding a lot more painless one of the big ones is splicing um, uh, splicing is this idea that um, well, so currently in the Lightning Network, uh, you know, anytime a channel um, gets depleted, you need to either rebalance or open a new channel uh, and close the old channel. Um, the idea of splicing is that you can make an on-chain transaction to sort of just top up that channel instead, instead of having to, you know, close all these channels. And you can just have one channel with a peer instead of having to manage a bunch of extra complexity. Um, that's something that also helps the non-custodial so uh, consumer use case as well. And what we, we, we saw this with um, Phoenix uh, Wallet recently shipping splicing in their big uh, giga node that supports all of their users. Um, uh, another one is standardization of the protocols wallets use. Right now, um, there is there can be a lot of confusion when making a payment um, using a lightning feature that is supported by one wallet, but not another. Um, you know, an example of this is sort of the, the especially with LNURL, um, there's this proliferation of, um, you know, standards within LNURL. I mean, a lot of people use LNURL to mean uh, this idea of just being able to make a payment to a single static identifier that looks like an email address, but actually LNURL is, is like dozens of different pieces of functionality that may or may not be supported by any given wallet. Um, and there's no short, there's no like immediate answer as to sort of how we're going to resolve these discrepancies. Um, but I do think what will happen is a general uh, convergence on, on best practices, like because there's gonna be a lot more data on what the users actually want. So any popular wallet at a certain point will um, I think converge on here's all the core LNURL stuff anyone wants because in a, enough people have complained at this point that we lack this. Um, uh, so, you know, LNURL is, I think it's seeing a lot of traction. I think people are converging that this is going to be a big, um, a, a big driver of a much better UX on Lightning. And now the question is which parts of LNURL are going to be standard? Um, mm -hmm. Lightning addresses, um, you know, withdraw requests, um, you know, wh which, which small, which sub components of LNURL are going to be the norm. So, um, it's a TBD thing it's something, and it's a question where we're working hard to answer on the infrastructure side of our business. Um, right. Yeah. I want to first dive into, um, splicing and I want to, I want to get your sense for like, how impactful is splicing actually going to be as a lightning service provider? Have you, is it possible to kind of like run through the numbers here and think what impact will that actually have on the margins of your business or on the, you know, the, the, the fees that someone might experience on lightning? Yeah. So as a custodial provider of lightning services, it doesn't move the needle a ton. What it does do is it makes our, um, 
our liquidity automation a bit easier and elegant. Uh, we don't need to, we don't have this issue of accruing all these sort of deadweight channels, um, things like that. But uh, we are increasingly interested in serving, uh, providing our, our, our lightning infrastructure services in a non-custodial fashion using some cool tech we're working on. And in that mode of operation, splicing makes it a lot easier to build the seamless UX for the enterprise customer that we really want. So that's an example where splicing really does move the needle. Um, I think splicing really seems to move the needle the most in, in when you're when you're serving non-custodial users, because what it really does fundamentally is it allows you to um, uh, easily um, sort of have this like kind of unified the, the on-chain funds and the Lightning Channel funds can a bit be a bit more sort of seamlessly unified in terms of how they're accounted for and presented as a, as a balance to the user. Um, when you can just sort of take some on-chain funds and top up the existing channel, uh, it just, it just makes things a lot smoother and easier to manage as a, as a service provider. Was splicing a key ingredient in you guys deciding to build out services for self custody rather than doing it custodially? Um, no, it just will, we're, we're, cause we're not, we're not, it's not a blocker. Um, it's not a blocker to make it happen. Um, it just makes things easier to do. It makes it simpler. Right. What was the, what was the rationale or if you, if you can share some of the, you know, thought process behind choosing to go this self custodial route. So, um, so to give a little context right now, the river lightning, um, service as a custodial lightning API. You have an account with a Bitcoin balance and you make API calls to process lightning transactions. Um, what one of the challenges there is um, different cost and, and that serves a lot of people's use cases, um, but it has a few downsides. Uh, one of the downsides is that as River, we're, we're acting as a financial institution, a custodial financial institution, which we are licensed and allowed to do. Um, but it, um, it does sort of, you know, just create a extra work for us, like from a compliance perspective to operate a custodial um, version of River Lightning. Uh, second, um, increasing numbers of customers um, want to have key material on their own, uh, on their own servers. They sort of want the, the, the guarantee that they're the ones holding the keys, um, not us. And so, um, because of that, uh, we decided that it would, you know, grow. We'd be able to grow the market and serve a broader customer base if we did offer a non-custodial version of the service. And so, the way that is going to work, and you know, it, it still has, you know, it's still sort of in the works. We're still working on building, you know, putting the final pieces in place. But um, the general idea is it's the exact same API and developer experience as the existing product of River Lightning. Um, the only difference is there's a remote signing process running on your server. That's very easy to spin up and run. Uh, you don't need to know a lot about lightning, but if you want to add extra layers of validation in front of the signer, you'll be able to do that. So that's the, that's the high level thousand foot idea there. Okay. You're saying, you're saying a couple terms that are triggering light bulbs in my head. You're saying remote signing, validating, does this anything to do with validating lightning signer are these related <clears throat> so we're not actually using that project in this at the moment um hmm. but it is something that we're certainly taking inspiration from um it's something we're going to take baby steps on sort of adding more and more complexity and functionality to this remote signing process um uh so you know it's direction like it's sort of directionally a similar idea um, i see but yeah but you know, we're trying to, we're trying to build it in such a way so that you can kind of choose what level of, you know, trust you want to have in us, um, uh, making it optional to add validating logic in front of your signing versus if you just want to sort of sign what we send you. Um, uh, so still thinking about some of those design, design knobs. Fair enough. Uh, there were a couple other solutions that you outlined in this, uh, lightning payments in 2025 piece. Um, 
One was reusable QR codes. I'd love to hear, and this is, I think is a Bolt 12 idea. Uh, I'd love to hear what, you know, cohort of Lightning users might these reusable QR codes be most useful for? Who, who's really going to be impacted most by, by something like that? So um, I think that there's the, the two user segments uh, for reusable QR codes, and more specifically, um, it's just more of a reusable identifier. Uh, you know, and the QR code is just representing that um, is, and, and I think the two customer segments that it's going to impact most are sort of in-person merchants and um, exchange, actually custodial exchange users. Um, basically, I think this unlocks like finally the, it's, it's sort of the last, um, sort of like the, the last UI requirement to make lightning a 10x better experience for moving Bitcoin between custodial financial institutions than on-chain Bitcoin. Um, you can now uh, whitelist destinations or pre-save destinations you would want to easily you know, send Bitcoin to in the future. A specific example of this is, um, you know, let's say that you buy Bitcoin on River, but you want to do you want to offer access some more exotic financial products on on another exchange at another financial institution. But you sort of trust River to be your Bitcoin bank, um, but you don't want to do, but we don't offer like every single financial service you would ever want to try. Um, so, you know, if you could just save your, you know, BitMEX address or your Coinbase address um, in, in River and just like click send to Coinbase, you know, send to BitMEX uh, and it just, the Bitcoin just showed up there immediately and then you could start trading. Um, and for BitMEX users, it's a much better experience because there's no delay from, you know, thinking, okay, I want to go make a trade to, um, actually engaging in that trade. Um, uh, um, so that, I think that that's sort of like one example. And then for merchants, um, especially sort of like Latin America, Mercado Pago is a very popular, um, uh, payment, uh, payment business. And a lot of merchants in Latin America use this payment rail and basically they just have a QR code uh, sitting on the counter at the, at the cash register. And they tell you how much you owe and you just scan the QR code and pay the amount. And then they see that the amount pops up on their system. Um, and uh, that's, it's like, it's really that simple. Um, Lightning will, would enable that same UX uh, for, for Bitcoin um, where you can just, you know, Somebody in El Salvador, um, a merchant can have just a QR code printed out, put in their store. They don't necessarily have to have like the, all the app access if they're an employee of the, of the business and someone could just pay, sc scan that QR code, send a payment. They don't need to like, you know, the merchant doesn't know, no longer needs to generate a custom invoice, show it to the sender um, and, and have all of that interactive friction. Right. And then you also highlight HODL invoices. Why is this a kind of key piece of the Lightning ecosystem on the merchant side? Yeah, so I think HODL invoices are one that I think it's I think it's a little TBD how popular these are going to be, but it's a cool idea of being able to um, sort of hold payment until some final action is performed. Um, because Lightning is because a Bitcoin payment is irreversible. Um, you know, the consumer protection aspects of it are still a little bit being worked out. Uh, if you are making a lightning payment to an online merchant, for example, um, the merchant may want to know that like, well, you've initiated a payment, but you don't necessarily want to fully release that payment until the merchant actually provided the service that you paid for. Um, and so uh, HODL invoices, you know, might move the needle there um, and, and may, give people a little bit more trust in using Bitcoin for online commerce. I think that one is sort of the most speculative of the future use cases, but um, I'm curious how you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I, I don't know how important consumer protection is. As you mentioned that, it, it triggered a thought in my head about, you know, every time I go to buy something online, if I ever have any problem, I've never had a like, request for a refund denied by Amazon or whatever. Like if I... If someone sends me a product and it's like broken, it's like one click solved money back or refund or, you know, you get, you get the product back or whatever. I wonder, I, I don't actually know how, how important that is to everyday people 
And if that could be a, you know, without HODL invoices, I wonder if that does, you know, limit people's willingness to try this thing where even if it's a small amount or a relatively small amount, spending 50 bucks on something, it's like, if you know there's no way to get that back, that could be a deterrent. I, uh, I think there's, there's a real case to be made that that is, uh, but I can't say for sure that, uh, that that's, you know, top of mind. And I tend to agree with you that really the, the true, um, uh, the true arbiter is the market and brand reputation. Uh, you can't really build a merchant. Uh, you, you can't build, um, a high reputation business that scales if you're just stealing everyone's payments. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so like short term, small stores that are scamming people, you know, here and there, um, those will exist, but, uh, they won't last that long probably. Uh, so it might be a non-issue. The market mm. might self-correct all of that. Very interesting. Um, okay. I want to also touch on the topic of custody. Is it, Cause in this article that you start out mentioning 90 plus percent of lightning usage today is custodial. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what do you think that balance ends up being if we get these changes that you outlined, the things that you think will improve the ability to uh, make lightning payments, maybe nudge self custody solutions a little bit uh, closer to parity with, uh, with custodial solutions, what does that actually do to the mix of, of lightning usage? Will we see more self custody usage than custody or, or just kind of like balances it out a bit? Yeah. You know, I, I still, I still tend to think that like for consumers, so if, if lightning gets really, really popular, um, like, like popular with very broadly beyond just Bitcoin users. Um, I think actually inevitably non-custodial lightning usage goes down as a percentage. Um, uh, but that said, a lot of these changes can still move the needle on making non-custodial consumer lightning a better experience than it is today. Um, and in the short term might increase the amount of people who use it. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be de depend on how on-chain fees behave. Um, uh, I think on like rising on-chain fees, regardless of like how easy lightning is will at some, at some value, at some number even makes non-custodial consumer lightning kind of painful, mm -hmm. um, depending on the size of transactions you're looking to make. Um, it also depends on how the routing fee market plays out as well. Uh, but I do think that, you know, what I would love to see is a world where, um, the enterprise node operations, um, continue non-custodially um, or majority non-custodially. I think that um, that's definitely like ideal for the health of the network uh, is for all of these enterprises to be running their own, to be running their, their own nodes or own, owning control over that lightning identity. And I think that, I think that part of the market, I think th that's going to keep getting easier and easier for companies to do that. Mm. So now we talked about some of the kind of technical challenges getting in the way of adoption. Assuming these are solved, it still strikes me that there's there's probably got to be a catalyst for us to really get this mainstream adoption. Like I, I don't think it's I don't think, you know, the people walking down the street that I bump into on my daily walk, I don't think they're like going, I really wish I could use lightning, but until you got splicing, I'm not touching it. You know, they're they're waiting for something that they can do with it. What do you think some of those catalysts might be that really get the Lightning Network to to become useful for the masses? Yeah, so um, I actually think one of the biggest catalysts is the major custodial financial institutions that support Bitcoin today um, treating Lightning first class in their products. And in order to make that happen, um, we need to get better at making it easier for them to um, justify the value internally of doing that work um, and, and educating them too. Not just educating them about the Lightning protocol, educating them about the product opportunities that Lightning affords for these companies. Um, that's how you get, in my opinion, Lightning in the hands of the most people 
Um, and I think that's actually going to be where the first wave of lightning happens. Uh, you know, like for example, like there's, there's two approaches, right? You can berate Coinbase on Twitter for not supporting lightning, but what that doesn't do, that doesn't answer the question. Here's 50 projects that we want to do as a company. I can say how much money each of these projects is going to make us. Um, how do I answer that for adding lightning at what, how much money does this like nobody has like said, and so that's sort of like, we're trying to reframe the conversation um, and go to these companies and say, here's why this is good for business. Here's the product vision. Here's what it can, here's how it 10 X is the Bitcoin transaction experience for users and long-term helps you make more money. Um, and I, so I think as act, like, that's, I think where actually the opportunity is there's all of these firms that have been built globally, regional exchanges um, that serve their customers very well um, that, you know, like they need to be, they need to be educated um, on how to build lightning into their products. So I think that's actually where the next big wave of adoption is going to come from. And it's happening. We're seeing it. Right. Yeah. So Coinbase is, is planning to integrate lightning. We saw Binance. Uh, we can get into that in a bit. Um, so we're seeing people making these business decisions to integrate lightning. Uh, do you think that the the term, you know, Bitcoin and lightning, do you think that is inhibiting adoption. The fact that there are two different things that kind of mean the same thing, but at the same time, they mean different things. Yeah. I mean, I think it certainly causes confusion. Um, I think what a lot of people forget um, who are very into Bitcoin is that the vast majority of people, even if they're adjacent to Bitcoin or have paid attention, they don't know anything about Lightning. It's very right. like, it, it kind of seems exotic. Like they don't really get it. It's hard to reason about. Um, and uh, yeah, I, like maybe there is a reframing of the conversation that needs to happen. This is actually just Bitcoin. This is just a better way to send Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I, there, there, there is something there uh, and I'm not sure how to change it. Right. And do you think maybe like splicing gets us a little bit closer to where on chain and lightning becomes a little, a little more seamless and you can kind of like obfuscate some of that complexity for end users? Potentially, um, potentially it, it makes it, it maybe more likely that any sort of consumer non-custodial wallet just builds, um, builds lightning into things. I think there's also though, just like this general sort of market demand um, issue, right? Um, really what lightning represents uh, in the, beyond the exchange to exchange use case, what lightning adoption represents is Bitcoin's growth or transformation from a store of value into a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say, I would put sort of like, Lightning usage outside of um, moving Bitcoin between custodial financial institutions, which I think is going to be the first big wave of lightning growth, because that still lives within Bitcoin as a store of value, which is a known like, which is we know that's why people are using Bitcoin today yeah. um, as a financial instrument. Um, that like lightning growth outside of that is correlated with people using Bitcoin as money for commerce uh, and it's not just lightning that it's not just the lightning protocol. That's, um, you know, even if the lightning protocol is perfect, right. People would still use more dollars than, than Bitcoin for commerce. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, even if there were no liquidity issues or anything like that. So, um, I do think it's, it's bigger than just lightning. Like Bitcoin just needs to keep growing up a bit. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, in our last episode, I was pulling up some of our, our conversation and you said, People have a hard time reasoning about the growth of networks. And when we were talking about Lightning, you said this, this could become orders of magnitude bigger than it is today. Uh, it makes sense what you just said about how, how Bitcoin and Lightning are kind of related and that Lightning can't win on its own without Bitcoin. The, the two kind of have to have to win together. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on maybe we can do this for Bitcoin and Lightning. How much bigger is the Lightning network? today than it was, I think we spoke in June of 2022. So let's just say last year, how much bigger is it today than it was last year? And what is the metric you're using as a North star 
to figure that out? Yeah, um, you know, the, the short answer is no one really knows. Uh, there's no perfect metric, unlike any on-chain um, app across the crypto ecosystem where you can clearly see in absolute terms any metric you would want because it's all very public and transparent. There is no um, foolproof Lightning Network metric. Um, people used to use capacity as a proxy um, for growth, but I think that's becoming increasingly less valid. Um, what we have seen is a growth in number of transactions in the network that substantially outpaces the growth in the capacity of the network. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been doing, you know, a lot of channel optimization and just getting more capital efficient as a company. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that you can actually process a lot of transactions without that much Bitcoin on a lightning node, especially if you're a custodial institution and you have, you know, flows in and out. So for us, the, the, the best proxy is what we see through our own nodes. Um, and what we're seeing is nice growth and we're going to be sharing some of those numbers. But, it, it, but it's hard to say, right? You know, I think you, you put out great numbers. I, I think, Kevin, actually, what, what sort of you published by talking to the providers on the network and publishing the, the metrics on like Wallet of Satoshi, um, uh, where you really kind of just have to ask them for the data. Yeah. Um, that's the best way to see what's happening because none of these public metrics really, really cut it. Yeah, that, that was, it was a big frustration for me when I first looked at Lightning. I was like... I don't actually know what's happening. Like someone tell me what, what are you actually seeing in your business? So anytime I see any of those, any of those metrics that anyone's willing to share, uh, I love sharing them as well. Um, what do you think about the, the Bitcoin network? If you're, if you're assessing the, the growth of the Bitcoin network is price the metric, is that still like a, a great North star metric for us to look at and go, if price equals up, then Bitcoin is getting bigger. Is that, is that right? Or is there a better metric that we could be using? Um, I still think it's a pretty good one. Okay. Um, but it, you know, and, and, and I don't have sort of like, I, I, I don't have, this isn't a scientific sort of analysis because I don't have access to all data. I only have access to what we see at River. Um, but what we're seeing with Lightning, where sort of like capacity is flat or going down, um, but usage keeps growing is also what we're seeing at on the brokerage side, um, which is, you know, our, our, our user numbers are growing very well, uh, but the price is very flat and boring. Um, so something's happening there. Um, you know, obviously we just have our own little local view of it, uh, but I don't know what. Uh, you know, and I don't know necessarily what explains that. There's a lot of explanatory factors. Like it's hard for us, for example, um, as, as, as a brokerage to distinguish between secular growth, like is, you know, is, um, are more people across the board buying Bitcoin around the world right now, or is, is our own market share just increasing, right? Um, it's, you know, so, so it, it's hard for us to have any real absolute answers on that. Right. And then are there any key kind of metrics you're looking out for when you think about, like we've seen a few cycles of growth in Bitcoin and in Lightning. Uh, and now you've been through a couple of them at River and you've seen, you know, what, what happens internally prior to some of these, you know, big moves up in either capacity or in price. Um, are there any particular metrics you're looking out for as like, these tend to be leading indicators uh, that we, we are able to track and, and kind of monitor uh, in predicting some of the kind of like next phases of growth. Yeah. You know, it's um, I wish I, I wish I did. Uh, <laughs> but the answer is really kind of no. I mean, most of the stuff we see is a trailing indicator, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of user behavior, like the vast majority of, the, of you know, client behavior follows price. Um, it doesn't lead it. Uh, like where is the, where are the price signals getting, sent um it's hard to say i mean in the last in the last bull market it actually looks like you know a lot of it you know we, we saw these two peaks you know up to 60k um and the sick the, the first one seems sort of more in line with what we've seen in previous bull markets sort of like a huge herd flooding in you know the price climbing sort of that crowd mentality the second one seemed very just like ftx was just manipulating a lot of stuff things were going wonky 
Um, and, you know, so, so price signal was set like out, out here um, and river clients are sort of like followed that signal. They weren't creating it. So, you know, the answer, the short answer is, I don't know. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Voltage. Voltage empowers engineers to integrate Bitcoin and Lightning Network payments into their business stack with an enterprise-grade experience. The team at Voltage is building the complete tool set so that you can do more than simply spin up nodes, but also understand and interpret your nodes' data. Their new product, Surge, gives engineers the capability to quickly solve problems and optimize operations. With node insights and visibility through time series data, you get dynamic and complex insights never available before. You can get complete control with insanely fast onboarding, advanced client-side encryption, and zero management infrastructure, making backups, networking, and upgrades simple. Get a free seven-day trial today at Voltage.cloud. Okay, let's get into uh, Taproot Assets. We spoke about that in our last conversation as well, and we kind of... You know, you made me think about how River and it was called Taro then, it's now Taproot Assets could, um, you know, that could be like a, a nice fit because you're an exchange, here's assets that could be exchanged. Maybe you guys can, you know, figure something out there and, and, and integrate that into your business. Has your view on the importance of Taproot Assets or your strategy on it evolved at all in the last year, or is it mostly just kind of waiting and seeing? It's still something that I'm very excited to see how it plays out. And obviously Lightning Labs has been making a lot of progress on shipping um, V1 of that. Taproot Channels unlocks that for um, for, for Lightning. Uh, Taproot Assets currently, you know, I think most of the on-chain stuff is built out. And Taproot Assets is the final sort of checkbox to be able to ship it on the Lightning Network. Um, yeah, so since the la over the last year, I've had a few... I guess realizations are maybe slight shifts in my mentality. One thing that hasn't changed is there's an obvious demand for stable coins. Um, and really it's not that people want stable coins. People want dollars. Like there's right. just an obvious demand for dollars worldwide. Um, the fact we call it a stable coin is probably kind of silly. Um, people just want easy frictionless access to dollars, which is what a stable coin is effectively just giving everybody. And, and I think that that's the reason for a lot of the growth. Now, I think the question is, okay, what does a stable coin on Lightning give somebody? Um, and is this um, going to unlock sort of a, um, uh, you know, a much better UX for, for using stable coins? And I think the answer is still TBD, um, potentially. Um, I haven't done the analysis on, um, you know, you know, a lot of stablecoin usage, for example, today is on Tron, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people don't care where the stablecoin is. Um, right. They just care that they can move it quickly and cheaply. And so if Lightning can effectively make it easier to quickly and cheaply move dollars, then Taproot Assets will be a success. Um, but it's competing with all sorts of chains under the sun. Right. And so it has to be a better experience in that. And so I think this goes back to this like exchange to exchange thing. There's, there's a, there's a chance where, um, you know, this is actually an incredible way to move dollars between financial institutions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so we'll see. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if, if the reason people are going to Tron is, uh, speed and low cost of payments, isn't it, uh, isn't it like a given almost that lightning is going to be faster than that and probably less expensive than that? Um, for the, so yeah, for the sender. So if we're talking about sort of the custodial model, right? For the sender, uh, it's going to be faster and cheaper, almost certainly, at least for average transaction sizes. Um, the, 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 the sort of difference is lock, you know, locking up this sort of capacity question, right? Um, because on Tron, or in, on any sort of, if it's on chain, yeah. um, you're just moving the asset from one account to the other, right? You don't have to pre-lock up any capital to facilitate the payment um, right? because of the shared global state. So um, that's sort of the, the gotcha 
right? And this is sort of the general gotcha with scaling a payment system at all, right? If, if there's almost, I guess there's sort of like an impossibility result. Um, you know, you need shared global state to have this ability to just like switch ledger balances. Otherwise you need some other way to, um, you know, ensure uh, the trustlessness of the system. Hence you need to sort of lock up capital into these channels to accomplish that. Right. <clears throat> so in the lightning space, I think we sometimes look at the fact that there's not shared global state. We're looking at like a local state. We look at that as an advantage. When it comes to stablecoins specifically, do you think that will be perceived as an advantage or will that be perceived as a drawback? It's a good question. I mean, because the stablecoin itself has shared global state, uh, like, or sort of like rolls up to it, right? There's, mm -hmm. a, there's some entity that issued this thing. And at the end of the day, well, well at least they know how much exists. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, it certainly will feel more private. Um, so I think for the user of it, it will feel a bit potentially safer. Um, but maybe for the issuer, it adds a little more complexity to the compliance obligations. Um, I really think it's, it's hard to predict exactly how this plays out. There's a really cool aspect to, um, to dollars on lightning, which is basically, uh, which, which we might see people really lean into this aspect of it, uh, which is you can like a routing is actually trading, right? So if you're running a node that facilitates paying, you know, a dollar channel, you have, you have a dollar channel and a Bitcoin channel and you're routing a payment from the dollar channel to the Bitcoin channel, you've actually just facilitated a, a trade. Mm -hmm. um, you're really running a, a, a you know, it, in many ways, it's kind of like running a trading op, a trading desk. Um, and so we might actually see it lead to some sort of interesting, like sort of the lightning network becoming almost like a, a trading network as well, uh, which, which is, which might lead to its own set of behaviors and, and, um, interest in stables and lightning. So would that be like a bunch of hedge funds setting up their own kind of routing nodes on the edges of the networks that we have in mind? Well, you don't necessarily need to be a hedge fund, but you know, it's it, like, it's just what it is, right? If you're facilitating uh, a, a payment that swaps two assets, that's a trade. So you mm -hmm. better be prepared to operate this thing, uh, you know, because you're, you, you, you probably then need to offset it, right? Um, otherwise your own position has just changed in one direction. So you probably need to place an offsetting trade behind the scenes. Um, uh, to make sure, because unless you want to just keep going longer Bitcoin, right. Or vice versa, if it's the Bitcoin channel to the dollar channel, that routing that payment is selling your Bitcoin. Right. So, um, uh, th this yeah. is not a trivial operation to run. It right. changes the game with like r running a multi-asset routing node, um, is a whole nother ball game. Are there any other assets beyond stable coins that you're specifically interested in or excited about or intrigued by? Not really. Um, I'm sure someone, people will do interesting things. Um, I mean, maybe people will port other coins over to lightning, like ETH channels or something. Um, I don't know why, but I think given what, how the crypto ecosystem has evolved, you don't really need a good why. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if, you, if you can do it, people will. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to see what people try. Yeah. Now I know it's tough to predict these things, uh, taproot assets being in development and not, you know, not ready yet for, for wide release, but do you have a, do you have a sense for when taproot assets might become a contributor to river as, as a business? Like what, what's your kind of like internal timeline that you're thinking about here when you're planning for taproot assets? Are you looking, is this like a five-year thing? Is this like a one-year thing? Yeah, I think for, for, for us, it's, we're, um, paying close attention to it. We're certainly going to be playing around with it when it's ready for lightning and we'll make a decision then. Um, we tend to do pretty long-term planning and I think it's, it's probably pretty late. I mean, I, I, certain, I certainly think it's not an H1 2024 thing. Um, my guess is we start seriously exploring it and it's like strategically in the second half of next year, uh, to see what it could unlock, but really, um, 
you know, taproot assets is like a, it's a broader question, right? Like as at river, you know, what, how do we do, do we, what do we do with stable coins? If anything, right. We haven't done anything to date with stable coins. Um, there certainly is demand. Um, and I think the question is, you know, before even asking about taproot assets, what do we do with stable coins as a business? What do we, what is the opportunity there for us? What does that unlock for our customers? And then the question is, well, what does taproot assets, how does taproot assets level that up? Mm-hmm. And we don't have answers to those questions internally yet. And then on the flip side of the opportunity, is there a thought that introducing stable coins, does that attract regulatory attention? Is there, is there a downside to introducing that? Uh, so, so certainly it, um, it adds complexity to the business. And what I really don't like about the, I, what I don't like about stable coins as a, um, as a company is it's one more thing to worry about failing. Um, so if we did it, we would do it in a way that like river wasn't representing that this stable coin was a dollar. <laughs> like this is an asset that the issuer is claiming is backed by dollars, but like know your risks, right? Um, we're not on the hook for making sure that that thing stays equal to a dollar on the, on the free market. Um, and so that's what, like, if we did build something, it would be done in such a way that like, um, made sure that our customers did understand the risks of these. And we weren't on the hook for if, if the peg broke. Right. <clears throat> but it, it is a pretty great experience if you need to send dollars somewhere and the banks are closed. <laughs> And yeah. the recipient is willing to accept the stable coin. It is, it is very clearly in demand. You're, you're not wrong about that. I think, I think there's just like been a ton of demand for that. And it's still, I think, continues to surprise Bitcoiners and folks in the broader crypto space to this day. So, um, yeah, I, I want, I want to touch on other layer twos. We've seen a proliferation of layer twos or side chains or proposals in the Bitcoin ecosystem. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how how lightning will interact with those other layer twos are these all like competing and going to be separated are these going to interoperate uh i've heard some i think lisa nigat had a good uh, uh explanation of how she sees it playing out with like a hub and spoke where lightning's the hub and all these other layer twos kind of like plug in what how do you think about the layer two ecosystem outside of lightning and how it interacts with Lightning? so I think it helps to be specific, you know, um, and real and sort of real, like lightning is the only Bitcoin layer two with any, um, that's Bitcoin native, I would say, uh, that exists today. I mean, the, other, the biggest other Bitcoin layer two is, um, WBTC, uh, on ETH or like custodial transfers on custodial institutions, like a cash app or something. Um, everything else. Um, Betty, um, uh, Arc, Liquid, the recent one, yeah, Arc. These are, um, these are sort of in, you know, the, each distinct from the, between each other, but they're, they're, they range from anything currently from the back of the napkin sort of idea to the sort of experiment that people aren't really using yet. Uh, I'd say sort of like, you know, Liquid is the most sort of in production thing. Um, and it's still TBD if, and when that gets any traction, Fetty is very much pre, you know, it's a really cool company. I think it's an awesome idea. Um, but you know, it doesn't have product market fit yet. Like they haven't launched. It's not like generally available. It's not widely used yet. They're still working on that. So, um, it's still very early. Uh, and arc is just an idea. Um, there's no, I don't even think close to production code at all. So in, you know, in theory, if, if, um, if these things do mature and, or take off, I, lightning can be a connector for these layer twos, but I think we're very far away from that even really being yeah, a meaningful discussion. That's fair. Will, will there be any markers or and maybe this again is too early to think about, but are there any markers that you're looking for in assessing whether or not another scaling solution is a useful kind of 
uh, way to spend your time at River. Like if you were to ever build out services, you have River Lightning services. If you were to ever build out services for another scaling solution, what would those triggers be that maybe you could go, we, we, we should do this because of X, Y, and Z? Um, I think it would be like a clear insight into sort of how this unlocks uh, basically a belief that this other layer two or layer three or whatever it is would further our mission of, uh, you know, um, helping accelerate Bitcoin's adoption as a store of value in a medium of exchange globally. Um, and so right now, I very much believe lightning is the layer two that will keep moving the needle there. Um, protocols, I think are protocols are very sticky. They don't come around every year. You have to put lots of effort into one thing to just make it work. So I think the lightning flywheel is what we're going to keep pushing on for the, you know, for the near future. Um, and my gut tells me in the medium term, the wins come from just keep continuing to improve lightning and getting more clever with it than things that fundamentally redesign from the ground up a separate layer too. But I'm also happy to be wrong about that, right? You know, if somebody does figure out how to get around this like liquidity thing, um, I'm not like, we'll see about ARC. I'm not super sold on it, um, but I definitely pay attention. Mm -hmm. So probably in the short term, it's just like the compounding benefits of building on lightning are probably going to start to accrue and show, you know, show returns rather than jump in between a bunch of different ones. Yes. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty against chasing new shiny things. Uh, protocols take a long time to develop and it's almost always the wrong thing to chase the new shiny thing instead of just continuing to improve the thing that's already got momentum and a network effect growing. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. I want to get into the river lightning node specifically. I've got a lot to cover here because yeah. you have been making headlines in the lightning ecosystem for a few weeks now. Uh, people shocked, surprised, and you know, just, just wondering what is going on at River with all these channel closures. I, I'd love to hear your kind of like behind the scenes story prior to, you know, closing some of these channels. What was going on in your guy's head? What, what led up to this decision? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's funny that like internally, it was the most uneventful thing you could possibly imagine. <laughs> um, externally, it became this night like, like uh, it wasn't really like a PR issue. It was more just like a stir. We created a stir. Yeah. Um, and, it, but it was, it was internally, it was the most like um, boring thing. I was like, you know, we have risk controls internally about how much Bitcoin we want to keep hot at any given time. And Bitcoin on Lightning nodes are, um, are hot. And so we started to bump up against these thresholds. And so, you know, we were like, hey, we need to get some Bitcoin off our nodes, um, keep things below below our risk tolerances. Uh, and so it was really kind of, you know, just a bulk action that we had done before, but not to that extent per se. And we just closed a bunch of channels that we didn't need. Um, we didn't impact our payment processing um, success rates at all. Uh, and a lot, and so what, what, it, what, what it created was a huge drop in the bit, in the capacity of the Lightning Network. Um, and we sort of just been reframing this. It's like, well, guys, like we actually, we actually did just make the Lightning Network more capital efficient. Um, yeah. And capacity is a really crap metric. Uh, you know, we should really be focusing on, we want the capacity as low as possible. Uh, and we want to be processing the most payments as possible with the least capacity. That's actually what we want to be targeting. The problem is sort of the denominator of capacity is the only public number. Uh, yeah. The numerator of, <laughs> transactions process is, a, is not public. So we're trying to reframe the conversation there because really it's in everyone's best interest to have as little Bitcoin hot as possible, it makes everything more secure. And um, we're gonna be doing more. Uh, but you know, what ended up happening was, you know, a lot of the growth of the capacity was dumb growth. It was you know, caused by um, not even us directly. Like we would just have huge peers where we'd, um, you know, much bigger companies than our own where um, our channel with them would get depleted so we just auto open a new one, which really wasn't even increasing the risk for us. But like our, our peer would just never close these old channels that were all the capacity was on their side. 
Um, and this was seen as capacity in the network. So we didn't just close channels where we had capacity on our side, where we wanted to reclaim that Bitcoin and get it off. We also just closed a bunch of channels where they were just totally depleted on our end and we didn't need. And, um, and that killed, that was actually the majority of the capacity that got killed. Uh, and we'll probably be reducing the capacity of the network by another couple hundred Bitcoin in the next few days here. Okay. Um, so FYI. Appreciate the heads <laughs> up. <were> <laughs> and and I, I don't remember the exact timeline of events, but I believe you guys reduced the public capacity by a couple hundred Bitcoin. I don't yeah. know if you were the first to do it or if. It, we, were we were the ones that, that caused that. On. We were the ones that caused that. So we did it. And then like, it was an afternoon. Um, and then I woke up in the morning and someone tweets at me, like, or I think it was Amboss, like, like, is everything okay at river? What's going on? And I was like, huh? And, uh, like I said, look at the, the capacity chart and I'm like, oh no, like, yeah, um, lesson learned, you know? So then it created, the, it was really an opportunity to educate people, but the lesson learned was like before doing any major channel management to give people a heads up online, uh, yeah. cause it just wasn't something we thought about. So we, uh, we, lo we learned and we're going to tweet anytime we do something like that again. And so I think there were a couple other companies that also did similar actions in the days following. Yes. Was this just them also going, Hey, river did this. And you know, maybe we should try the same because, because we don't want to have excess capacity on lightning either. I, I think, it, I think probably, I don't know for sure. Um, if we set the trend, it kind of seems like we did, uh, because uh, it's been going down ever since. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it seems like other people are going, yeah, you know what? Like, geez, like, why are we, why do we have all these channels we don't need? Right. Let's close them. So, uh, so yeah, maybe we're starting a trend here. Yeah. And, and still to this day, it's, I think been a few weeks payment success rate. Have you noticed any change better or worse? Um, no, uh, really the, the driver of payment success rates for us are, rarely any large um sort of really really rarely relate to any liquidity issues from uh like in sort of our vicinity of the network it's usually around long tail destinations attempting to get paid or um or issues at popular peers right so like somebody for example changes their ip address some big node changes their ip address and doesn't give the network a heads up. So payments start to fail. Um, those are sort of the drivers of failures mostly. I see. Now there, there were a couple of theories I saw on Twitter and maybe I, maybe I saw on some videos of folks going, you know, maybe river is closing kind of public channels and opening private channels. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Is that, is there any, nothing to it? Eh? Nope. Nope. No. We just don't need them. Yeah. So, so what I want to talk a little bit about the private side, because that is the other part of capacity that doesn't get shown in this like public capacity metric. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys think about the role of private channels at river? Like how important are they versus the public channels that we see? Yeah. So I believe we have a few private channels between us and some peers, um, but we do use private channels internally. So the way our node architecture works today, is we have the two river nodes, river one, river two, uh, that we run for redundancy. Um, and then uh, on the back end, we have two internal nodes that are have channels with the routing nodes. And the internal nodes are the ones that actually generate, um, originate all the payments, uh, both like generating invoices and paying out. Part of the reason for that, most of the reason for that was just an early architectural decision after consulting with, you know, people in the know um, when we first launched the company to kind of keep the databases separate. Like we have this, these routing nodes, we didn't necessarily, we were kind of worried about performance long-term um, of like, we didn't want the nodes generating all the invoices to also be the nodes doing all the routing mm -hmm. um, for scalability reasons. And so that's why, so we, we use private channels internally for that. I see. But on balance, like I asked, I asked this question, I believe, to Henrik Skogstrom at mm -hmm. uh, Torque, previously LN Capital. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I said, you know, if, if there's 5,000 Bitcoin of public capacity, is the private number bigger or smaller than that? He wasn't sure. He said, you know, could be bigger or could be smaller. I don't, 
I mean, as far as I know, most of the private capacity is these like sort of consumer non-custodial wallets. Like, uh, I, if, if, I, I could be wrong, but are, are all like the Phoenix wallet channels private? I couldn't they... tell you. Yeah. So my understanding is that a lot of it is that. And so I don't know the amount of Bitcoin in those. It's probably not small. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to find out that it's about double uh, capacity, but I really don't know. So total being 10, five and five roughly? Like that's what you mean when you say double? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would probably say max five. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if it was exact. exact I, I would think it would actually be less, but. That's fair. I really don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where all the private channels are. It's probably non-custodial non consumer wallets. Okay, interesting. Um, I, I've been watching very closely at the Binance node. I've been watching them grow and, uh, I'm looking through their list of channel partners and I see, oh, river, river one, river two, river one, river two. There's about six. I think you, you may have been like the sixth through 12th channels that were created on, on Binance or something like that. Mm -hmm. Why do you have so many channels with Binance? What, what's the reasoning there between having multiple channels versus just one big one. Uh, well, it mostly has to do with automated um, channel management logic, uh, which we're continuing to refine. But um, I think we're seeing net flows to Binance. And so we open these channels automatically. Um, and it just takes a while to like, call the old ones that get completely drained. Uh, there isn't like a huge like impetus to do it in the short term. Um, so uh, that's most of the reason uh, is sort of automated channel logic. And we tend to avoid any like really big channels off the bat because of our risk tolerances for, you know, um, hot Bitcoin, right? So uh, this is an example where splicing would make things a little bit easier, right? Where we just have one channel with Binance and we just splice in as like on demand on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the reason. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. To see the results for yourself, you can check out my personal website, where I host transcripts for all my podcast episodes. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. Okay, so now, now that you've been, you've been building a Bitcoin exchange with Lightning integrated for many years, and here you have your colleague CZ building out Lightning for the first time, uh, what advice can you share to him uh, if you were in his shoes, what would you be doing at Binance, given that you now started this node, uh, you're coming up with things, what do we do with this node? How do we integrate lightning? Uh, what is your first action step? You know, to be honest, like the node stuff, yeah, a smart engineer can figure that out. Um, at Binance at scale, they have like a jillion dollars, like the, the guys will run the nodes properly. The, what, what I would be focusing on is finding the product leader who's going to make sure that they think very, um, they put, they put a lot of thought into like, how do we actually capture the value of lightning at the product layer? Um, the value of lightning, like lightning is a protocol, but no one cares about protocols. People care about what they can do. And so the product thinking is really what, where I think a lot of people fall short. Um, and that would be my advice. So capturing value at the product layer. Yeah. So for example, right. Um, you know, what, like the, you know, the first step of just adding lightning as an option, right. Kind of equivalent to all of your other coins and flows. Um, but what can LNURL unlock for us, right? Should we be giving, um, should we allow, you know, should we be giving lightning addresses to Binance users and teaching them how to make it really easy to send Bitcoin from other places to Binance via lightning? Um, excuse me, uh, are there sort of like incentives we can be giving for people to use lightning over on chain? Um, how are we pricing it? Right. Um, uh, 
uh, does this give us the opportunity to become more, more of a better wallet for people than just an exchange, right? Does this allow us to be, you know, like sort of start moving strategically to not only financial trading, but also um, facilitating, you know, commerce transactions and things like that. There's a, there's a whole sort of like world of product possibilities that I think Lightning unlocks over time. And um, I think most people assume it's just one more way to deposit and withdraw Bitcoin, but I think it can do a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. But now on the, on the capturing specifically, like how do you capture that value? Because if you look at, you know, a traditional payment processor, you can say Stripe um, or, or any, or Visa or MasterCard or anyone operating in the fiat system, there's like a select number of participants and they all seem to have very strong moats and distribution and scale. And um, it's, it's a very a different game capturing value there than uh, a protocol at its kind of like earliest stage where there is, there's very little um, economies of scale. It's, it's relatively permissionless. Anyone can kind of set up a competitor. Uh, how do you think about the actual capturing part of that? Well, I really see it as for, for a company like Binance as being a first mover and just using it to, le to level up the customer Bitcoin experience. Right? Mm -hmm. um, drive more transactions, drive more economic activity on the platform. That will lead to more revenues long term, right? If Binance becomes your core wallet. Um, um, and I think Binance is just an example here, right? Like I, I would, you know, certainly probably guide people towards probably, you know, exchanges that I, I have more certainty about the financial health of. But um, uh, nonetheless, I think it's just an opportunity to level up the Bitcoin transaction experience of your product. Um, reducing the amount of time it takes from depositing Bitcoin to doing something on the platform from 30 minutes, multiple confirmations on the blockchain to instantly deposit, start performing an economic activity. Um, and there's just like a lot of product things you can do to, to push that and make it easier and easier. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I believe this was also written in your uh, Lightning Payments 2025 piece, but any, any use cases that you see for Lightning beyond payments that maybe others haven't quite clued into yet? I mean, you mentioned like a lot of people are still thinking about this as deposit withdraw. What other things can people, you know, can you kind of, uh, let's do a little brainstorm session here. <laughs> I think you mentioned yeah. VPNs as a possible uh, solution or a possible kind of product in this, in this piece. Um, you know, what else kind of comes to mind as what lightning can unlock for someone. So, you know, one of the factors that I, I look at is what can um, an instant payment unlock that a delayed payment couldn't um, with Bitcoin, right? What is, what does that instant transaction and settlement allow for now? Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about a number of different things there that, and, and I think, um, I, I think the real opportunity is getting into sort of more traditional payment flows that can be improved with Lightning that exist outside of Bitcoin today. The stereotypical one is like the remittance payments. Um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, but TBD, um, one of the general macro themes has been that over the last five to 10 years, every region in the world has a pretty high quality crypto exchange, um, which means that they have a high quality uh, way to swap between their local fiat currency and Bitcoin. Well, you know, Lightning can connect all these institutions um, to instantly transfer value between each other. And I think what that unlocks is the opportunity for these institutions to have seamless fiat to fiat payments between them with Bitcoin as the intermediary transfer mechanism um, over Lightning. Uh, so I think Lightning has the opportunity to make these exchanges more than they are today um, by interconnecting them all and allowing them all to share, kind of like how sort of BitKnob launched it, sort of they have this API where you can deposit Lightning, it automatically converts to um, the African currency of your choice. I think they support a number of them um, and it, it gets deposited to a, to a, a bank account um, associated with the phone number that you give it, right? Well, you know, that API can also exist in India 
and other countries, right? So if you connect all of these guys in a network, um, you've now created this fiat, like this like instant fiat to fiat payment network um, powered by lightning at the core. So I think there's something there. That's something I've been digging a lot into. The, da- the challenge there is like the biggest opportunities are with the international business payments. So like international remittance, like there's a lot, there's still issues and stuff for consumers, but there's a lot of people trying to tackle that problem in the traditional way. Um, and it's gotten a lot cheaper. Um, a lot of the opportunities in these like big international business payments, the problem there is the size of the payments isn't conducive for lightning. And so that's where there's sort of this open question of like, can lightning provide anything there or not? Uh, and that's also something I'm interested in exploring. How, how big, so how big are the payments that you're referring to here and how much bigger do lightning channels and lightning, does lightning capacity have to get to support that? Well, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I think we put out an international, so we put out actually a cool report on international payments uh, and Bitcoin a few months ago. And if you look at the chart of like the volume of international payments, how much is like remittances versus business payments? I mean, it's, it's around, remittances are a rounding error. Um, Mm -hmm. so we're talking like anything from a hundred thousand dollars to billions of dollars, right. For an international acquisition or something. Um, and so, you know, these amounts are, um, you know, what, what, what sort of, you know, banks handle day with big international wires, uh, there's a lot of inefficiencies here, but it's unclear that Bitcoin or lightning can help. The answer is probably in some like subcategory of those, there's opportunity, but no one's really cracked that nut. Hmm. And I think, I think there's opportunity, but it's going to require more digging. So these are payments like Apple paying Google or, you know, Tesla paying some other like really large um, payments. And, and because lightning fees scale up with the size of the payment, that fee is going to be pretty large at the scale of a billion dollars, even if we could support that through a chain. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it could be a billion dollars. It could be a million dollars. It could be like $5 million. It could be buying iron ore from Australia, right? Right. Or paying, you know, the mining company. Or um, it could be intra-company, right? It could, you know, for multinational companies, often they're moving money between their own accounts in different countries. Um Maybe there's opportunity there, right? So, uh, um, yeah, it's an interesting space. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Okay. This was a a really informative conversation. We got into a lot of different topics. Let's jump into some quick rapid fire questions. I may have repeated some of them from, from last year's conversation. I think I need some new, new rapid fire questions, but let's start off with, uh, book recommendations. Anything new that you are, are reading lately? Um, yeah, actually, I'm reading a really cool book called The War Against All Puerto Ricans. Uh, it's um, a fascinating history of um, sort of like this post, post-Spanish uh, ownership of Puerto Rico. So like when America took it over in the Spanish-American War till today, um, kind of opened my eyes to a lot of the history that I wasn't quite aware of. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, any advice for builders that are looking to step into Lightning for the first time. I know I asked that about CZ specifically and Binance, but anyone else listening to this podcast who says, Lightning looks pretty cool. Seems like there's some traction here. I want to build. Where do I start? Um, Start with problems. Um, Unless you're already at an existing company that's like, I want to add Lightning payments um, to what I have today and I have a clear product reason to do so. In which case, you know, educate yourself on running a Lightning node or look at services like ours, River Lightning, that can make that very easy for you. If you're looking at, if you're not, but if you're like an entrepreneur and you're looking at the Lightning space as a place to build, um, you know, I think the biggest mistake people made is make us starting with the what and not the why. Um, like focus on the problem that a sizable market faces or a growing market faces and be very realistic about why like, can, like can how lightning can improve that versus other alternatives um, and um, don't start building until you have a very strong thesis there um, 
uh, unless you're just a hobbyist and tinkering around, which is totally fine, but focus on the, a real problem you're trying to solve and deeply understand why lightning is the solution to that. That's what we need more of. Right. Okay. Outside of river, what is your, what is your favorite lightning app to use? Um, this could be, know, I, could be wallets. This could be apps, like anything. I still really like y'alls. <laughs> um, it's, it's just like a fun OG stacker news is great. Uh, love stacker news. Um, uh, the ability to just like, uh, you know, tip and, um, uh, sort of like boost an article is, is really neat. Uh, zaps on Noster are very fun. Um, Noster is, I think getting like, from my, from what I'm seeing, it's kind of stabilizing in terms of its usage base. And it's kind of like it hit that peak. And sort of now it's at this sort of like stable, healthy, like user base. And I think, um, I think it's in a very healthy place. So I'm excited to see how like Lightning and Noster continue to interact there. So those are my two favorite, I think. Fair enough. All right. And then finally, uh, who's one builder in the Bitcoin or Lightning ecosystem you'd like to give a shout out to for doing great work? Um, you know, I think I always like to give a shout out to Lightning Labs. Uh, you know, they, they, they've, you know, really moved the needle on, on lightning. They're the, you know, by far the most popular lightning node implementation and, um, put a lot of work into making that and put a lot of work into making lightning network successful. So I'd give a huge shout out to them. Awesome. Before you go, uh, where can folks learn more about you and river? River.com. Uh, easy to remember. Um, I'm at Leishman, my last name on Twitter. Uh, and follow us on Twitter too, at, at River. We have some cool, we post cool research and, and content. I think you'll find it interesting. Excited for your next report. Thank you so much for taking the time and I hope we can do it again soon. Thanks for having me on. In the last 30 days, you guys sent in 23,387 sats. That came in from 26 different supporters. Big shout out to everyone who's been contributing. Let's run through a few of the latest comments. We had a few comments on episode 118. We have uh, Blockchain Boog says, I like the explanation of VLS by Ken. Very technical concept. Vake said, great episode. Again, on episode 118. Blockchain Boog said, stack it up. This interview showcases the struggle to get help on episode nine of Stacking Sats with Margie Ramos. And then Lou Moore said, great rip on episode 112 with Cody Lowe. If you haven't checked out those episodes, definitely take a look. Uh, and I can't wait to see what you guys send in this week.